On today's Ralston Hockey Exclusive, I am joined by U18 Women's Gold Medal winner, captain, and national champion with Minnesota Gophers, where she was also WCHA Defensive Player of the Year and top three finalists for the NCAA Top Female Collegiate Player. She was selected second overall by the Toronto Fury in the 2014 CWHL Draft, a four-time gold medal winner, where she represented Team USA, where she won silver at the Sochi Olympic Games, an NWHL All-Star and Isabel Cup winner. The list goes on and on. I started playing against her when we were around seven or eight years old, where she dominated the boys' youth hockey in the Midwest for years. We played against each other in one tournament that still haunts me to this day. <laughs> I'm excited to catch up with her, Megan Bozak. What's going on? Thanks for having me. That's uh, quite an introduction, but... I, I probably left off about half of your accomplishments because the list is pretty <laughs> long, but um, what are you up to? Where are you? I'm actually living in Burlington, right outside of Toronto. Uh, was playing here when I was drafted to Toronto Furies for a year and then actually switched over to the NWHL in Buffalo, but my fiance and I bought a house here and we've been here ever since. How is uh, the quarantine? going for you guys it's going um nothing it's there's nothing new any day yeah. it's the same but it's nice to get into a routine the weather's getting nicer so it's nice to to be outside and do that but definitely uh there's a lot of downtime <laughs> are you uh you and your fiance staying busy i mean I, he's an athlete correct yeah he plays rugby so it's nice that we'll get up we'll walk the dog we'll train together and then he's actually working as well. So gives him a few hours to, to work and, and get that settled while I do puzzles. Yeah. <laughs> Stay busy. Yeah. Um, Crazy. So we met, I mean, probably we were eight, nine years old. I was playing for Honeybaked. You were with Team Illinois. And we probably played against each other for better of six years or so. Um, how did you basically get into hockey? I have two older brothers that were playing and I was always at the rink and my parents decided one day to throw me on the skates with my brothers. And it's crazy that I fell in love with it right away where I'd wear my skates around the house. I'd rip the carpet. I'd put holes <laughs> in the wall playing with my brothers, but I loved it from the moment I started. Um, so you played for Team Illinois, which, you know, at that time, I think our league was like seven or eight teams. Now there's like 20. It's, it's gotten so expanded. But what do you remember? Because I can remember we played against each other. It felt like once a month for yeah. five, six years. But I sent out that I was having you on. I was going to be doing some questions with you. And some of your old teammates, David Zuza and Sam Calabrese, <laughs> commented about the Pee Wee Quebec tournament that you guys beat us in in a shootout, which still haunts me to this day. But what do you remember about that tournament? I mean, I still think I still was, I was talking to Cam Fowler the other day, and he was like, "Still one of the best tournaments I've ever been to." It was incredible. Like thinking back, that they, they do have it today, but you played teams from all over the world. Right. And it's funny that we played each other there because we played <laughs> each other every month. But uh, how that whole tournament was put together from the ice sculptures to meeting new people to the rink that I actually got to play in two years ago. And I was driving through in Quebec and I was like, this is like a flashback from yep. walking into the stadium and everything. So it was really cool. But um the competition and the teams and the energy in that building is something I will never forget. And obviously beating you guys. It was, <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I can remember like for warmups, we, our team had Frisbees that we signed and we threw them into the stands. We thought it was like the coolest thing ever, but. And like trading pins and stuff. I, I still have a, like a massive box of, there has to be 70 pins in there from <laughs> the Yeah. But, um so as you got older um uh, do you remember what age you were when you basically switched from playing with boys at youth hockey to you know full-time women's hockey 
Uh, eighth grade was my first year. How was and, that experience? Like, was that something you wanted to do or was that you felt, okay, it's time to start playing on this side of the game? I think I knew I had to. And grade seven was the first year of checking for us. And I was okay. I held my own the first half of the year. Right. And then the second half of the year, everyone was bigger than me. So that was, that was kind of tough. So I knew it was time. Um, so I was fortunate enough my eighth grade year to play up um, a level. So I was playing with the 16 and unders okay. for the girls' side, which really helped me out. And we had a great team, and I had actually the same women's coach for all five years. Oh, wow. What, um, do you remember your first introduction or experience with USA Hockey, whether that was a festival camp or your first team that you played with them? Yeah, it was the U14. Um, USA Festival, and I think we were in Rochester, New York, and we had our state tryouts and we had our regional tryouts, and then if you were selected, you went to Rochester for a week, and I remember just being in awe of how many girls there were playing, because like you said, we would play the same, the same teams for our league, and then seeing how many other players there were from Alaska, and not right. that many still players from California and stuff like that. I thought it was really cool. Um, met a lot of people through that and then was fortunate enough every year to, to go to those festivals in the summer. And then 2008, they announced the first U18 team. So there was a select festival in August. And if you were picked for that team, you played a three game series against Canada. And then world championships were that January where I actually got cut from the first U18 world but then made it the second year. Wow. So that was your, you guys won gold that year, correct? Yeah, in 2009. So that was your first real experience with Team USA in a sense, uh, or yeah. from a team perspective and playing yeah. against other countries. Um, how did you make your decision on Minnesota? I mean, how old were you when they started talking to you and that you knew, I mean, is that where you always wanted to go? I actually always wanted to go to Wisconsin. Okay. And I got recruited from Minnesota at the Stony Creek tournament, which it all, I feel like hockey just comes in full circle because I live 20 minutes from there now. I coach <laughs> against Stony Creek. I'm at that rink quite a few times a year when I'm in the area. So um, I believe that was my grade nine or 10 year. And then I didn't commit until going into my senior year which was nice. It gave me a lot of time to think about what I wanted to do, what kind of schooling I wanted to go into. And I visited Boston College. Uh, I visited Harvard and Wisconsin. And right when I went to Minnesota for my visit, when I stepped on campus, I knew that's where I wanted to go. There was just a feeling that I could spend four years there. I could move there tomorrow if it, if it were that easy. But um, everything from what I wanted to study to the hockey team, the program, the campus itself was was unbelievable. And I wanted to stay closer to home. So my parents were able to see a lot of games, which was awesome. Um, so you go to Minnesota and throughout that you're playing with Team USA at World Championships. Can you explain to someone or the people that don't know how – basically the process of you're, you're playing for Minnesota, but you're also going to all these camps where it's basically a, seems like a never ending tryout to, you know, it starts, you know, at a certain date and there's almost stages of it. Can you just explain basically how, you know, you juggle both of them, you're allowed to leave and go uh, compete with USA while you're playing college hockey? Yeah. So it gets tricky sometimes, but with the academic side of it, but right. You have a camp every August, and it's a, a massive festival for USA Hockey for, for the women's side, and there's over 100 people that go, and again, it's for picking teams for a U18 and a U22 team that they play three games right after the festival is done, and then obviously the over 22s will compete for a spot for a Four Nations Cup um, roster, and that is in November. So if you were still in college and you were picked to that team, you just flew right to the tournament. But if you were out of college, you went to a camp beforehand. If they would bring high school girls 
in to fill spots for the college girls that weren't able to make um, the pre camp. And then you'd go to that, and then you would have a December festival as well, where they would try to pick the roster for world championships, which would be in March. And again, if um, so you would usually leave the day right up the day after Christmas. So again, like we had tournaments and stuff, it was nothing new. You'd leave the day after. Right. And then in March, depending on how far you made it in the NCAA tournament, you either went to all of the pre-camp for world championships or you just met right after your season was over. And then there was a strength and conditioning camp in June. <laughs> started, you started all over. So it, it really makes you appreciate how much you traveled for AAA hockey because right. I knew I had to get my schoolwork done. I knew I would be on the road for a long time. So it actually set you up for success. But I ran into a tough situation. I actually both my junior and my senior year at Minnesota. I majored in sport management, which is ironic because my senior thesis paper, first day you get their syllabus and it says, if you miss two classes, you have to fail the class. <laughs> I'm like, okay, great. If I make worlds this year, like I have to miss at least three classes. Right. Yeah. She wouldn't budge at all. So I'm like, I don't know what, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I sent in, I had to like meet with him numerous times, sent in my oh paper, my I had to give my paper while I'm at worlds, our only day off. I have to wake up very early and like presented to the class over Skype or whatever we were using. It was insane. Like I actually thought I was going to fail. Oh, and she yeah. just give you the extra day. I, I don't know what made her <laughs> let me do it online, but I was very grateful for it. Yeah. Because I understand like in bold letters, like if you miss two classes, you'll fail. I'm like, okay, do I walk out of the class now? Do I stay here for the next hour? What? Like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. That but. is incredible. Yeah. Um, so yeah. when you're playing for, you know, these USA teams, especially when you were younger, I'm assuming, you know, it's, you're one of the best players on your team where you come from. And now you're walking into a room where everybody's the best of the best on their team and their area, whatever it is. How was that adjustment for you when you were younger, kind of, you know, finding your role? Hey, I might not be the number one or two right away and just adapting. And, you know, it seems like every year that kids get older, they're on new teams, new players, new families, new organizations, and there's a feeling out process. You know, how was that for you, um, especially when you were, you know, starting your career with USA Hockey in a sense? Yeah, I, I mean, I think to this day it, it hasn't changed. Yeah. Different camps, different players, different games, different line mates, different staff. Right. Uh, starting out, it, I think it was hard, but when you went to your first USA camp, it was so exciting. It was right. so overwhelming in a sense that you just wanted to put on that jersey and go out and play. Yeah. And then once you finally defined what your role was, then the next week it could change. So I think that adjusting and adapting to that was, I don't think it's easy for anyone, but you have to find what you're good at and that's what got you there. But then making sure you are helping your teammates in the way that you need to help them when going back to Team Illinois or Chicago Mission, I was a different player right. and I was playing a different role than with Team USA where I was more defensive, but looking to shoot the puck a lot, not rushing the puck up like I would do at home. Oh, and so, then all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm trying to figure all that out. And then the next camp, you have a different coach. They're looking for something different. The way I played in 2014, I had to change my game drastically, like a complete 180 to try to make the 2018 team. Right. And like getting cut from that and now I'm in a different role with with Team USA so it I think it's constantly evolving like that but you you have to learn to to play that role and, and practice your strengths at what make you compete at, at that level yeah I mean it 
seems like every day, especially every season, you know, if you're not evolving as a player or figuring out what's going to work for you at that time, then you're probably on your way out if, you know, if you can't, you know, somehow yeah. make it work. Um, so in 2014, you were drafted second overall into the CWHL. How was that experience for you? I mean, were you obviously this is something you were looking forward to and hoping um, and kind of the experience from the CWHL to the, um, you know, you played over in Russia, you were in the NWHL, three of the major top leagues uh, for women's hockey. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, in 2014, after the Olympics, I went back home to Chicago for a bit with my family. And what's funny about getting drafted for the CWHL, and it was the same for the NWHL, is you put your top three cities that you would want to play in because with making no money in the CWHL but still continuing to play, they had to make sure that you could afford to live in a city. So you usually picked a city where you were living at the time or you knew someone or you had a job. Um, so I put down Toronto because my fiance was from here. And so luckily I got drafted by Toronto and it was a fun year. Um, we weren't the best at all, but we, <laughs> we had a good time. It was nice. Um, a nice adjustment after the Olympics to, kind of move into the professional world and that's actually when I got involved in coaching in Oakville um, and just doing different things so it was nice to, to keep playing and again at that time I wasn't sure if I was going to continue to play if this was going to be my last year and yep. then once you you join a new team and all of that like you know you're not done yet so um, after Toronto I decided to join the NWHL because it started in 2015, 2016. And I was able to play for Buffalo, which was only like an hour and 20 minute commute, which was nice. Okay. Um, so with that, the CWHL and the NWHL, you know, they've in the last year, women's hockey has grown a lot with, you know, trying to bring basically to the forefront of making it a, a legitimate not that it's not a legitimate league, but a league where you guys can go, where you can make a livable salary and, you know, partner with the, the NHL and have the backing of that. Um, so last year there was, I don't want to call it a lockout, but almost a stoppage of play that a lot of the girls through the PWHPA union, correct me if I'm wrong, um, decided, you know, we're, we're not going to play this year. So that took you overseas to Russia to play in the top uh, women's professional league there how was was that your first time living over there I know you've traveled over there a lot but actually living yeah, there, it was it? um you were outside of Russia right yeah so I played for the Chinese team okay. so I made three round trips there throughout my time um because I had to come back for USA games so I was in China we were in Shenzhen and which is like closer to Hong Kong and they have an incredible setup there. So we have our own apartment building just for our team, wow. like our, our own chef and our own arena. It's the amount of money that they invest because of the 2022 Olympics being in Beijing. Right. Being the host country, you get a bid for your team. So they're trying to develop those Chinese players and trying to find Chinese North Americans that um, have their passport or are eligible to get their passport. Um, so you're playing on this team, but you're also trying to be an ambassador to help right. their country, help their team grow for 2022. So it was really fun exploring Shenzhen. Um, and then playing in Russia, we went to a ton of different cities wherever the team was that we were, that we were playing, but we would always have downtime there and off days. So exploring and seeing different things was, was great. And I think about women's hockey we're trying to make a livable wage and going from signing a contract in the NWHL where we got our salary cut the first year by 50%, but still wanting to play. It's not livable wage. It's still not livable wage in, in the NWHL, but that's how women's hockey is not founded, but that's how it has been. Right. And that's what PWHPA 
um, what the members are trying to change at because we want to make a livable wage. We want to play hockey for a living at the highest level. And if that means we can't necessarily play in a league to see if the, the NHL can, can help us form that, then that's what a lot of us are willing to do. Have you seen, you know, in the past, I mean, as recent as the past two to three years, a, a change in women's hockey in, you know, almost you guys uniting and saying, this is something that we need to do, not just for, you know, our generation, but more so for the younger generation and helping promote women's hockey and, you know, almost the stigma of this is men's hockey, there's women's hockey, and basically just across the board, it just being hockey. and the women having their league, the men having their league, and they're both, you know, backed and united, you know, through each other, which in the long run will only help the sport. Right. So you look at the NBA and the WNBA, um, not um, very knowledgeable on their model, but seeing how they have worked together is just incredible. So the men have actually been so supportive and, we, as a group in 2017 for USA Hockey, actually boycotted the World Championships that were held in Plymouth. And we weren't considered employees of USA Hockey, and it was a lot. So we were fighting for a contract. And we knew at that time that what we're fighting for and what we continue to fight for won't benefit us to the full extent. But when we see it five to 10 years down the road, when a lot of us are playing anymore, that's the reason we fought from day one. It's not for us. It's, it's for that next generation, like you said, because a lot of what we are trying to work for, we won't see the full benefits of, but watching that come in full circle in a few years will just, will just be incredible. But working together with the NHL and just seeing how those, those men's teams and women's teams do it, I think it has to be, it has to be a future for us. And I think it'll be a bright one. Is that something that you guys talk about, like, you know, behind closed doors or you're texting with, you know, other women that you've played with or that are involved with the PWHPA that you guys are saying, you know, hopefully we can get this going right now, but how cool will it be in 10 years when, you know, we're, we have this role in the union or the league or whatever it may be in, you guys were really the reason as to why it it started to happen. Yeah. I, I think we're constantly reminded of that when dates are pushed back or what we think is going to happen in a month is now going to happen in in nine months, hopefully. Um, But yeah, I think we talk about that a lot because you get interviews, you get questions from these young girls that have no idea. And once they see how much we've had to go through and how much we've had to fight for, then I think they'll fully understand. But women's hockey is growing rapidly. And there have been so many more girls wanting to play and women wanting to play, even even adults wanting to learn. Um, I think it's just a testament to what we're all doing. And it's it's funny because with the PWHPA, there's Americans and Canadians, and right. we are – such big rivals on the ice, but off the ice, we talk more a- about the game than than people would think. So yeah. obviously, it's intense on the ice, but off the ice for what we're fighting for, we're all we're all in it together. That's awesome. I mean, I, I hope that you know all works and gets figured out sooner than later. Because I mean, like you said, it's I'm sure you growing up, it was you played your youth hockey, then you played college hockey for all team USA. And then after college, it's like, well, I've worked my entire life for all of this. I'm one of the best in the world at what I do. And now I just have to go play, you know, some select tournaments here and there where it's, you know, you along with many other women have this talent where you could make a career as the men have done. And I think that's a perfect example, how you said basketball, you know, they have the WNBA that's partnered with the NHL and, you know, hopefully women's hockey and NHL can get to that same page where it's sustainable. Um, and you know, you can make a living off of playing hockey like you've done your entire life. Um, well, let's circle back real quick. Tell me about your experience at the Sochi Olympics. Um, you know, just from the, 
the process of you making the team to just your overall experience, um, you know, something that not a lot of people can say that they've ever done. Yeah, the, the process is not easy. And like you said, um, it's a constant tryout. It's a tryout every single day. And you know it going into it, but you don't fully understand that right. any day, like we walked into the gym one morning and one girl was cut without us even knowing. So it's, we had a tryout in 2013 in Lake Placid. And from there they picked, I want to say 25 girls and only 21 were on the roster. So we knew from August when we all moved to Boston as a group to the end of December that there were going to be cuts made. And we had no idea when, we had no idea how. So every day at practice, every day at the gym, every game that we played against Canada and at the Four Nations that year, it was a, there were eyes on you at all times. So um, I think a saving grace that year was we all built it with families if we wanted to. So I lived with a family, which was great. Um, so I think that really helped me have something else outside of the right. arena. Because we were there, it seemed like for 10 hours a day. Um, so yeah, one day we show up, one girl is gone. Um, month later we show up and other girls gone. And then four days before Christmas, um, we had played in North Dakota against Canada and I had hurt my shoulder. So I wasn't playing that game. So I was like, I was beyond myself and I wasn't sure like what to think. We knew that the cuts were going to come before we were able to go home for the holidays. And we get pulled into a room at 1 AM at the hotel. And as you look around, there's only 21 girls in the room and two others had been cut and you're looking and you're like, okay, well, this is, this is a team, literally one of them. Here's the team. You go home for, uh, I think we went home for four or five days and you're not supposed to tell anyone because it was being announced at the winter classic in okay. Detroit. And so it's hard to keep a secret, but you tell family and then, and then you celebrate and we were still in Boston until we left probably two or three weeks before our first game there. And the process is pretty cool though, because you flew to Germany and that's when you went through all of your processing. So you get all of your Nike, that's sweet. Gear, you go to like these stations. It's real. it's really cool. Um, you try on your Olympic ring, you go to an Oakley station, you go to your, uh, like your Ralph Lauren station for your podium gear. And it's, a so real experience and then you fly with other USA athletes to Sochi you go through more processing there and then who uh, have, who who's you your hit. favorite non-hockey player athlete that you met at those games in our building so we were in a USA building so it was yep. pretty cool because the <laughs> the curling team loves to have a good time <laughs> um the hard thing about the Olympics is you're competing the whole time. So we went from the day, the day after opening ceremonies was our first game. So we actually didn't walk in opening ceremonies because we played the next day at right. noon. And then we go until like two days before closing ceremonies where other sports are kind of a one and done. Um, so when you're competing the whole time, you can't really experience what other people are experiencing, but yeah. The curlers, um, they experience everything, which was <laughs> great for that. But you have figure skating. Um, a lot of the, the mountain sports, so bobsled, skeleton, they stayed at a different, um, like, residency closer to the mountain. So we didn't see them much. Um, but it was really fun just to, to even watch them compete as well. And, I mean, one of my favorite moments from that Olympics was watching TJ Oshie. Yeah. In, in the shootout. That was in, incredible. We fortunate. I don't know how we got tickets, but a handful of us just went and it was, yeah, something I will never forget watching that. Absolutely. Um, talk about two real quickly, the uh, rivalry series with uh, it, the final game was at in Anaheim, right? Yeah. Um, was that one of the bigger crowds that you've played in front of and 
obviously scoring that goal must have been uh, one of your highlight goals potentially. Yeah, it. this rivalry series started last year, and it's great because it's all post-grads. And since we have a lot of girls out of college now, it just gave us three more games that we could play Canada. Mm-hmm. And our first game in Victoria, um, that was a sold-out crowd, which have you ever played in Victoria? I've – For Island? I don't think I have, actually. They love their sports there. Okay. And that was a really fun game to play in. And then – they actually actually ended up winning in overtime. Vancouver was another really cool experience. And then Anaheim, home crowd. I think that was our biggest home crowd we've ever played in front yeah. of. But the building was electric for us. They did such a good job at promoting it and getting families and friends and everyone in the stands. So it was such a – it was actually amazing. You would never think that in Anaheim. Um, our hotel we stayed at was – right by Disney. So that was just, Such you just don't expect these things. Yeah. Playing. Um, but yeah, we take it to overtime just in the right place at the right time. <laughs> but just during that building go crazy. My mom was, was able to fly in just for that game. And wow. um, it's a great way to finish that rivalry series, but Anaheim, the ducks, we actually got to practice with them for a bit. Right. The days and um, we were able to use their locker room and they were so accommodating to us. So it, it helps make our experience better when they are so giving for us. So it was a really, it was a great week. Um, and then obviously with world championships being canceled, it's, it was a good way to finish. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, we've got a couple questions for you here and we'll, we'll wrap up. Yep. Um, well, your old teammates, actually, from youth. Zuzu wants to know if he's a fast skater. You don't have to answer that. Who is – I don't even remember him. <laughs> he's going to love that. <laughs> um, Calabrese asked about Quebec. We've already gone over that. Um, what kept you motivated in training so hard as you did throughout your career? You have to understand the reason why you play and why you continue to play. And I don't think anyone can tell you that you're done playing except for yourself. And I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned is you have to take the good with the bad because if you always focus on not making that good play, getting cut, um, I think it'll just diminish everything that you've worked for in your life in hockey. Um, and with being cut from the first U18 team to making an Olympic team and then being cut from the next Olympic team right. and still continuing to play, um, you have to find it within yourself and, and understand the reason you play. Because I, when I put on the USA jersey, every single time I get chills looking at it, looking around the room as to who's on that team at that time. It's, it's a very humbling feeling and experience, and I, I wouldn't change that. It's such a great answer. And you kind of touched on this, but this next one, um, you know, did you ever get down on yourself? If so, how did you pick yourself up? And, you know, you just mentioned, you know, you played in the Olympics and then you were cut or you were cut from U18s and you made that, um, you know, the mental side of it, a lot of people, you know, are starting to understand, but it's, if not as important, if not more important, I believe, um, you know, in my career, I was injured, I've been cut, I've you know, done all of that. And I think being mentally strong almost is more important than, you know, what you're doing on the ice. But what were some of the, you know, setbacks that you've had to overcome throughout your career? I've been pretty lucky with injuries. Um, so I would just say getting, getting cut. It's hard, and especially when the first team I had gotten cut from was that U18 team. I thought the world was over for me. Yeah. I thought I would play for USA, and um, I was I was beside myself then. And then you go a few months later, and you go to another camp, and then you make the next World Championship team. So all is all is right again. Right. But <laughs> you have to you have to look at how hard you worked and it sounds so cliche, but you, you have to, because if you want to put in the work, I, good things will happen, whether it's how you planned it to happen or not. Um, but looking back, I, 
it, it's hard to get cut and then and then bounce back from that. But I've been cut U18s, Olympics, and I would not change a thing with how I trained, how I prepared for things because in my mind at that time, I was doing everything I could. So I don't have any regrets about it. I think you have to look at and rely on your teammates at that time because you're so focused on hockey. You're so focused on being perfect in that game. Um, your teammates, you see more than your families, which we've grown up with since the age of six. Right. Um, you, you really have to rely on them to make sure you know what else there is besides hockey. So when you go to the rink for those two hours, you can focus on that. And then once you leave, you, you have those people to talk to about things, to, to help you through those things. So I think that uh, even learning that at a young age, too, with how close like all of the teams I was on and, um, and what that you were on, it, it really helps knowing that people are in your corner for those times. Definitely. Um, why did you choose number nine as a hockey number? I didn't choose number nine. Um, I love number 19 because my brother Steven wore it. And I was lucky enough to get it at Minnesota because someone had graduated the year before me. And then for USA, I actually wore 25 for my first world championships. And then number nine, became available the next year I was like 9 19 sure I'll take gotcha. it <laughs> that's, uh, that's the story I didn't uh wasn't my first choice yep more so handed down um how often do you shoot and stick handle outside of just being at practice when I was younger our basement wasn't finished so I was really lucky with that because I did it all the time with my brothers and it's funny to go down in our basement. Now there's rollerblade marks and puck marks and it, it's insane to look at, but um, going to school then with being on the ice every day, I didn't do as much off the ice, but now I've started to appreciate doing it more because when I'm not on the ice, so I would say probably four times a week now, um not shooting but stick handling for sure just trying to hone in on on small things where do you think uh you know women's youth hockey is today not necessarily at the professional level but from when you were growing up I mean you just said you made the switch over to women's hockey when you were around 14 years old and you were introduced to oh my gosh there's all these teams all these girls playing all over the country um from you know your viewpoint where do you see it in today's uh like era it grows every single day and it's it's awesome to see the girls teams competing in the in the boys league where i think it should just be a league and there should be any team you want and i think a lot of the girls are starting to start out playing with the girls which is great because they can develop together but yeah. the skills that i learned playing with the boys I think helped me a lot in my, like my game specifically, but girls game, I think is growing at a rapid pace and there are going to be so many more. There are so many more girls watching games on TV and asking, Oh, why isn't there a girl in the NHL? Right. Um, so it, it's just fun to see that, but I think the sky's the limit for, for females playing. Um, and you kind of touched on this earlier, but quickly, um, you know, basically summarize what the PWHPA is and, you know, your, your kind of thoughts on it and where it is right now. Yeah. So professional women's hockey players association, and it's a group that we're looking to better women's hockey and trying to make it a professional living salary for us and trying to do that by putting it in the right hands and having meetings with the right people to to hopefully better the game and and make this a reality for us and you have to realize that you can't just throw someone into it give them money and say okay go right because I don't think it will be set up for success in the future and I think it took a big step for a lot of us to join that and say okay we can't play in a league this year but two years down the road when hopefully we do have a professional league under 
a professional standard with having trainers at the rink, right. having tape available for us and little things that you wouldn't think about. Um, that's what our movement is trying to, trying to go forward. I, mean, I think it's incredible and something that's long overdue. Um, what are you up to now? Like in the summers, do you have, um, I believe you're doing some hockey camps or, I mean, hopefully doing them depending yeah. on what's going on, but where can people kind of find what you're doing and, um, you know, how you're giving back to basically hockey and women's hockey? Yeah, I spend a lot of the summer uh, right outside of Toronto. So I actually run the high performance program for the Oakville Hornets and we have skates every Tuesdays and every Tuesday and Thursday. So we're not sure if that will be starting in June, but we'll hope. Um, and then I run a defense only camp with Courtney Kessel. And then I actually have a company called nine hockey with Kristen Richards and it's adult skates okay. and any level of adult. If you've just learned to skate, if you've been skating in the league for however many years, I'm just running those adult, camps and skates that they can feel comfortable out there because a lot of them say I love watching a game and I love watching my kids play but I wish I could help them or I wish they could help me so I can learn the fundamentals of it so running those throughout the summer and throughout the year have been really fun it's so rewarding just seeing them progress from day one to day three and learning how to catch a pass and and skate with their head up things that a lot of us take for granted but learning it at an older age and still wanting to learn right. uh, is great. So we'll see how many, how many skates we can get in this summer. That's awesome. I mean, I think that's a great idea. And I mean, obviously anytime you can give back and help and grow the game in your community, not just women's hockey, but hockey in general, um, you know, that speaks volumes. Um, how much longer are you going to play? Well, what's, what's the next goal? Every day I wake up and my hips hurt, my back hurts. Well, for you, is, um, the next, is, it, is it the Olympic Games? Is that your next, what your, you, you know, your, your future goal almost? Yeah, I've, I've learned as well to take it kind of day by day, step by right. step. I feel great. I still feel like I can compete at the highest level. So right now my goal is to try to make that 2022 team um, and – before that, beyond that, I I can't tell you with everything that's going on, it's it's hard to plan, it's hard yeah. to predict what's going to happen, but I'm very comfortable with where I'm at and, and hoping to put on that jersey again in 2022. That's awesome. Well, I can't thank you enough for uh, for joining me. It's been it's been way overdue and um, probably the last time we were on the ice together we were probably 13 or 14 years old. So it's been, it's been a long time, but I, you know, reached out to a couple of people and told them that I was going to be talking with you and especially the girls here in Detroit. I work with, um, you know, a good group of them and they all knew who you were. They were all saying, you got to ask these questions. So I know you've impacted uh, women's hockey, um, you know, a tremendous amount and, you know, the game is better off with, you know, people like you, not just on the women's side, but hockey in general. So thanks so much for, uh, for joining me and it was good talking with you. Yeah. Thank you.